Welcome back to part two. This is lesson eight, ADC. So ADC stands for analog to digital conversion. Let's have a look at an analog waveform to see what this is all about. This is a kind of typical sinusoidal waveform that you would see generated from something that's an analog device. If we overlay that with a digital conversion of that same waveform, you can see there it's a little bit more choppy. The number of samples per second is how many slices you take per second, and the bit resolution is how many steps there are to each of those different levels. Let's understand a bit more about how those bit levels work. Binary is a number representation format that uses ones and zeros to represent every number. And if we look at this on the screen now, you can see there, if we have a 16-bit number, that means that we can store a maximum of 65,535 numbers with in that 16-bit number. You can see there the value of each number doubles with each extra bit that's been added to it. We wanted to store the number one, it's basically 15 zeros and then a one. If we want to store 65,535 then it's all the ones. Now if we want to use signing, we want to say we have a negative and a positive number, we have to essentially split the, the value in half and we have a special sign bit on the very end. So you can see the very leftmost bit there, that's our sign bit. One would mean positive, zero would mean negative for example. And that means that we can only store a maximum of 32,767 numbers, but we can say whether they're minus 32,000 or positive 32,000 and every number in between. This video is sponsored by PCBWay, your ultimate destination for all things PCB manufacturing and assembly. Whether you're a hobbyist, a startup or a seasoned professional, PCB Way has got you covered. PCB Way offers an impressive range of services. They provide high quality custom design printed circuit boards for any application you can imagine. From single layer to multi layer, flexible and even rigid flex PCBs, they have the expertise to bring your designs to life. PCB Way ensures fast turnaround times and affordable prices without compromising on quality. With their state of the art facilities and advanced manufacturing techniques, they can have handle small prototype orders up to large-scale production runs with equal precision and efficiency. PCBWay offers additional value-added services such as PCB assembly, component sourcing and even functional testing. You can trust them to deliver the fully assembled and tested boards ready for integration into your projects. One of the best parts of PCBWay is their user-friendly online platform. It allows you to easily upload your designs, get instant quotes and track the progress of your orders in real time. Plus their dedicated customer support team are ready to assist you with any questions or concerns. So whether you're working on an innovative Internet of Things device, a robotics project, or anything in between, PCBWay is your go-to partner for reliable and affordable PCB manufacturing and assembly. Head over to PCBWay.com today and turn your ideas into reality. With PCBWay, your trusted PCB manufacturing and assembly partner. So an ADC device will convert an analog waveform into its digital counterpart. And that means that we get a number back rather than having to understand what the actual waveform is. So if we wanted to get the value of say a potentiometer, then we can basically do the ADC conversion and the, the value that we will get back will be a value between say zero and 65,535. Analog input is used to measure the continuous range of values of a physical quantity such as light, sound or temperature. To use a pin on the Raspberry Pi Pico for analog input, you need to configure it for analog to digital conversion and this is done using the ADC class in MicroPython. Once a pin has been configured for analog input you can read an analog value from it. To read the value of an analog input pin you need to use the read underscore u16 method of the ADC class and this means read an unsigned 16-bit integer. Let's take a look at potentiometers. Potentiometers are variable resistors that can be used to control the voltage in a circuit. They are often used as volume controls or to adjust the brightness of an LED. To get started you'll need a potentiometer, some jumper wires and a Raspberry Pi Pico board. Now that we've got everything set up, we can write some simple code to read the potentiometer's values. First let's import the necessary libraries. And now let's set up the potentiometer. We've connected the potentiometer to GPL26 on the Raspberry Pi Pico, which is this yellow cable just here. Finally, let's read the values from the potentiometer and print it to the console. We'll do this in a while true loop and we'll simply read the value in to a variable that's called value, print it to the screen and then sleep for an amount of time. This code will continuously read the value of the potentiometer and print it to the console every half second. We can also monitor this on the plotter. As you can see, the values printed to the console change as we turn the potentiometer knob. And that's all there is to it.
temperature sensors are used to measure the temperature of their surroundings. They're an essential component in many projects for home automation to weather stations. Let's get started by connecting a temperature sensor to the Raspberry Pi Pico. For this demonstration, I'm using a MonkMakes sensor board version 1. We'll use the code from the previous project as a starting point using the ADC to read in from pin 26. So we're going to have another while true loop and we'll grab the readings like before where we calculate what the temperature is in degrees Celsius. UART, which stands for Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter, is a common serial communication protocol used to connect microcontrollers to other devices such as sensors, displays and GPS modules. It's an asynchronous protocol, which means that the transmitter and receiver are not synchronised by a clock signal. Instead, they rely on a predetermined baud rate to synchronise and transmit reception of data. To use UART on your Raspberry Pi Pico, you'll need to configure the UART pins and the baud rate. First, you'll need to identify the UART pins on the Raspberry Pi Pico board. Note that there are only five UART UART pin pairs on the Pico and you can only use two of these pairs at a time which have different IDs 0 or 1. You can't use two UART pairs with the same ID. We then configure the UART pins using the machine.uart module and set the desired board rate. Once you've configured UART on the Raspberry Pi Pico board you can use it to send and receive data to other devices. It is a bit fiddly and if you haven't got the ground connected between the two devices you may get garbage coming out because the level of the signals is not the same. Now, I have recorded another show about how to do Pico to Pico communication and you can find the link to it just up here. I squared C is a communications protocol used to connect microcontrollers to other devices such as sensors, displays and input and output boards. It uses two wires for communication, the serial data SD and serial clock SCL. It's also common that you'll need to provide three volts for the board as well as a ground pin. Now Pimeroni do a great range of I squared C devices. If you go to their breakout garden section on the website you'll find all kinds of sensors, input devices, cameras and so on that all use that same I squared C device. And if we just pick one of these for example this BME 688 4-in-1 air quality sensor. You can see if we go down to the library section and then if we go into MicroPython and examples we can find there the breakout BME 688. This is how we would then use that board in our code. We would have to use the helper function that's provided in the batteries included Pimroni MicroPython which we can also get from the Pimroni website. We can see here that they've, uh, they've got the SDA pin connected to pin 4 on the Pico, the SCL for the clock connected to pin 5 and in this particular example they're using a Pico Explorer uh, which has a separate set of pins. So depending what kind of board you're using you can define which set of pins you're going to use for this. And then to initiate the I squared C and use it in our code we simply create a variable that's called I squared C and then we make the Pimroni I squared C and then pass it in which kind of board that we're using. You can see here that the BME variable this represents that sensor itself so that will get all the different air quality sensors for us. It can pull them back very very simply. So it depends on which type of board that you're going to be using. It depends on what kind of f features and functionality you will have in this particular sensor. <laughs> SPI stands for Serial Peripheral Interface and it's another communications protocol that is used to connect microcontrollers to other devices such as sensors, displays and memory cards. It is a synchronous protocol which means that the transmitter and the receiver are synchronised by a clock signal. It uses four wires to achieve this. There is the Master Out Slave In or MOSI, there is MISO which is the Master In Slave Out, there is the Serial Clock SCLK and then there is the Slave Select SS. This is an example of a piece of software I created called PyChart and it enables you to create little tiles on a very small screen and you can show sensor data and do fun things like that. You can even make images display on the screen. So if you want to know how I did this then check out this video in the card up here. And these are little SPI screens like this one I've got here. This is from Pimeroni. This is a tiny little screen, 1.54 inch and it's 240 by 240 pixels. You can see all the little pinouts there at the bottom. We've got the voltage, got the ground and all the other pins as well. Some other screens such as this one here, they have a built-in SD card reader on the back because also that uses SPI. So you can see this screen is 128 by 160 pixels, it's 1.8 TFT and this one also has SPI connections on it. And other sensors that require very fast transfer of data such as this optical flow sensor. Now, this is another Pimeroni sensor. This is a near optical flow sensor and this one allows you to effectively create your own optical mice by tracking the X, Y and Z position changes. 
Next up it's servos. A servo is a small device that rotates to a specific position, making it ideal for controlling movement of robots, drones and other projects. It has three wires, power, ground and signal. The power wire provides all the power to the servo, while the ground wire provides the common ground for the servo to the Raspberry Pi Pico. The signal wire is used to send a signal, a pulse width modulation signal that we looked at earlier, to control the position of the servo. To connect a servo to your Raspberry Pi Pico, you'll have to connect the power wire to an external 5 volt supply and the ground wire to a pin on the Raspberry Pi Pico board and we'll connect the signal wire to a pulse width modulation enable pin on the board. The signal wire is typically connected to pin GP18 on the Raspberry Pi Pico board. This is because this pin has pulse width modulation enabled. To control the servo with MicroPython you'll need to use the machine.pwm module to generate the pulse width modulation signal that controls the servo's position. I've created a quick demo here. The code is very very simple. We're simply just setting up on pin 18 a servo which is uh, using the PWM module. You can see there it's sweeping through the, all the different positions and it's simply doing that by just adjusting the duty. These are ultrasonic rangefinders. They have a microphone and a speaker and when they send out a signal we can measure the time it takes for it to hit an object and then return that signal back. If we have that we'll get the exact distance. Now these two look exactly the same but they're actually very different and one of them works with 5 volts which the Pico is 3.3 volts so that, that's no good for us and the other one is actually 3.3 tolerant. So if I show you these two side by side so you can see these side by side. The one on the right hand side where it says echo, transmit, SDA, trigger, RX and SCL. That one is 3.3 volts tolerant. The one on the left hand side is a 5 volt one. They look exactly the same apart from that but the chip on the rightmost one on the U3 chip. That's the thing that enables it to work with the Raspberry Pi Pico. You can also get I2C ultrasonic rangefinders. Here's one from M5 Stack and that contains everything you need inside there to get connect this up using the Grove connector. To connect the ultrasonic rangefinder to the Raspberry Pi Pico you need to connect the voltage and the ground pins to an appropriate power and ground pin on the board and then the trigger and echo pins are connected to GPIO pins on the board. In this animation you can see a sound signal will generate from our robot and it's approximately 30 centimeters away from an object. Once it hits the object the sound wave will bounce back and then we can measure the distance that was travelled which can be calculated by taking the, the sound measurement how long it took for the sound signal to come back to the robot, dividing that by two and then multiplying it by the speed of sound. Here's a snippet of code that will show you how to do this in MicroPython. Ground pins are a type of GPIO pin that's used to complete an electrical circuit. They provide a low resistance path for the electrical current to flow back to the power source. Without ground pins, circuits would not work properly or at all. There are eight ground pins on the Raspberry Pi Pico. They have a sort of squarish head connector as opposed to the round ones for the regular GPIOs. And they're all connected together so it doesn't matter which ones that you use. I've created a simple demo of making an LED flash on and off. And you can see that we have to use the ground pins to complete the circuit for the LED. So if I run this little program, it'll simply just turn the LED on and off. So I've run that, you can see that it's flashing on and off every second. So what's happening here is the LED has two legs. This is an LED, and you can see that one leg is slightly longer than the other. The long leg is the live leg, that's how I remember it, and that means that we need to send a voltage, 3.3 volts is fine, to the live, to the long leg, and then for the short leg, we need to then connect that to one of the ground pins on the Pico, and it doesn't matter which one, they're all interconnected, and that will complete the circuit. So then if we send a signal, we make that go one, make the value go high, and it will send 3.3 volts through that circuit, and then the ground pin will complete that circuit, and the light will go on. And the code is simply making that voltage go high or low depending on what part of the code it's in. Let's take a review of what we've learned in this course. So in this course we learned what MicroPython is, why you should use it, where to download it from, and what type of software to use to develop MicroPython code. We've also looked at how to connect various different components to the Raspberry Pi Pico using the different types of GPIO pin. We covered what GPIO pins are and all the different types including digital I.O., pulse width modulation, analog to digital conversion, I squared C, SPI. We also looked at how to write MicroPython code to control various different things like LEDs, motors, servos, and ultrasonic rangefinders as well. We also looked at how to use potentiometers, temperature sensors with the Raspberry Pi Pico. And we wrapped that up by looking what ground pins are and how to use them on our circuits. So now that you completed this course, you're ready to take your skills to the next level. 
So you'll be able to do things like robotics, which is my favorite thing. You'll be able to build more advanced circuits, use more advanced MicroPython code and work on even more complex projects. So I hope you enjoyed this course. Uh, I went on holiday halfway through recording this, which is why I've got a slight bit of a tan as I've come back. Uh, but I hope, and I've also changed my hat as well because we didn't like the red color for some reason. So I've gone with the, the black hat. So I hope you enjoyed this video and I shall see you next time. Bye for now. Bye.